Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the auditorium at the Mars Discovery District in downtown Toronto. We are here for the second in a series called Innovations in Mental Health. This is a collaboration between Mars and CAMH, the Center for Mental Addiction and Mental Health. The agenda is here as well to kick off TVO's Mental Health Matters Week of special programming in collaboration with CAMH. We are live streaming this now on two of our websites, our regular website, theagenda.tvo.org, and a special website just for this occasion, tvo.org slash mental health matters. And if you have not been able to be part of our audience here, you can still be part of our conversation. Our producers are holding a live chat right now on those two websites, so dial up and participate. You can also chime in using Twitter, using two different hashtags, MarsCamH or hashtag MHMatters. Chime in, participate away. Okay, what are we going to talk about tonight? Well, one in five people in our society will have a mental illness at some time in their lifetime. So we are going to showcase five CAMH innovations in mental health. We are going to travel from the neurons inside our brains to the neighborhoods we live in to discover how innovation is transforming lives. We're going to see a series of videos tonight to show you these developments in action, and you will get to meet the experts behind these innovations when they join us on this stage here beside me to talk about their work and then answer questions from people here in the hall. Before we meet the innovators, let's introduce our two hosts for this evening. Ilsa Troyernick is the CEO of the Mars Discovery District, and Dr. Catherine Zahn is the president and CEO of CAMH. Welcome them, if you would. Well, let's get in this, because this is uh, quite a collaboration for your two organizations, and I guess we want to start. You also go first. Uh, why is this of such significance to your organization that you've wanted to put this much resources behind it? Well, clearly, uh, mental health, as you've indicated just from the reaction you've had, is such a critical um, issue for Canada and for the world. Um, the burden on individuals, on families, on workplaces, on the economy is growing and we know we can't tackle this uh, challenge by doing just more of the same. So uh, we have to innovate and uh, I think this partnership is particularly uh, powerful because we work in adjacent spaces in the innovation process but we're also both you know, committed to exploring collaborative models of innovation and so we know that by working together we can do more uh, both in terms of raising awareness, but I think equally importantly in terms of finding new, new approaches and new solutions. My hunch is people think when they think of your organization, if you're looking for a partner, you're looking for somebody in healthcare. This is not healthcare that people think of when they think of Mars. So how did this connection come about? Well, I guess I would say that uh, the partnership has, has three levels of importance for, for me. The first one is the obvious uh, reason that any business goes into a partnership. You uh, increase your resource base both uh, the human resources, in in including our intellectual capital, and your material resources. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a good choice to make. From uh, the, the perspective of, of CAMH, we've done a lot of work on trying to increase awareness surrounding the issue of mental illness and to increase the ability of our research and our innovation activities to get out there to have a uh, deeper penetration and a wider audience. Uh, Mars, on the other hand, has, uh, has expertise in innovation and has a platform for innovation. So in uh, my opinion, we now have a greater opportunity, just witness this audience, to uh, increase the depth and the breadth of our ability to get the message out there. Just and do a, can I do a quick follow-up on that, though? Because, again, if you think, the, you think innovation, you think technology. You don't necessarily think innovation mental health. Where does the connection come from? I think that it's fair to say that the most remarkable innovation in the world of mental health has uh, been more ideological or behavioral and very simply we've embraced the assumption that people with mental illness can recover, can get better. So we have brain science, we have social science, we have uh, systems research that, uh, that, that tells us that it's, it's 
not so interesting anymore or not so fruitful to have an argument about whether this is a brain problem or an environmental problem. We have plenty of evidence to uh, um, help us understand that it's the interaction between a, sometimes a vulnerable brain and sometimes a overwhelming environmental uh, 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 things mm. that, uh, that, that produce the behaviors or the feelings that we interpret as a society as, as mental illness. So, so changing that, that paradigm and understanding that it is not one versus the other, we can stop the polarizing conversations in the world of mental health start to work together on other partnerships, partnerships that actually uh, work to reduce the barriers between services, between providers of, of uh, mental health care, and uh, help us develop care pathways that are, are generative and are conducive to recovery. We want to remind folks at home how they can participate if you're watching us on our website uh, or if you're watching us on our special website for this, tvo.org slash mental health matters or if you're coming uh, to us via Twitter, uh, we invite you to use the hashtag MarsCamH, M-A-R-S-C-A-M-H, or hashtag MH Matters, and we are happy to take your views tonight on mental health, on innovation, the connecting of the two together to try to, as has been suggested, solve problems. Okay, you two, thanks very much. Stay put one second, because we're gonna throw to some tape here and then start to get some of the people who are behind today up here and hear from them. We're going to hear from some of the innovators uh, right now. When CAMH scientists Dr. George Fusius and Albert Wong wanted to help motivate people with serious mental illness, they turned to virtual reality. Let's take a look. One of the challenges that we've had in mental health research in general is how best to capture some of the symptoms and difficulties that the folks that we see have in their day-to-day -day lives. Up until now, what we've relied on are uh, specific tasks or abstract kinds of tasks as well as questionnaires that really don't allow us to get into that in the moment experience that people have. Uh, virtual reality technology offer us the opportunity to really look at the difficulties that individuals have in a lifelike environment. One of my particular interests is around motivational deficits that these folks experience and the impairment that that causes in their functioning over the long term. What we've done is try to look at how people go about carrying out common everyday tasks, things like going to a grocery store, going to a laundromat, going to a doctor's office to make an appointment, or going to a pharmacy to pick up their medications, and trying to decipher you know, what, what the, the difficulties these people have and what are the brain areas that support us being able to accomplish these tasks. When you combine virtual reality with, with MRI and specifically with functional MRI, we're able to look at what areas of the brain are critical for supporting activities that we do in the real world and how we go about completing and accomplishing everyday tasks. And Dr. George Fusius joins us here on stage at the uh, auditorium at Mars. You want applause for him too? All right. <laughs> applause, applause, applause for the video, applause for the good doctor. Uh, okay, so we get the theory, virtual reality. Do you have any evidence yet that it's working? So we do. What we find uh, so far is that um, individuals with schizophrenia, this is the population that we've been working with, they, uh, they seem to have difficulties keeping up with the pace of, uh, of working towards a goal the way um, healthy individuals would. And that seems to translate into them having difficulties in the real world as well. Um, this is related to uh, other clinical measures that we have of motivation or apathy, as, uh, as it's called. And, um, uh, they, they just don't work as hard and they seem to, to give up a bit, uh, a bit quicker than, uh, than other folks would. Um, and what we know is that, is that this, uh, this, these motivational deficits are the critical link in terms of uh, predicting functioning for these folks in the future, um, which is probably the biggest driver of cost when it comes to, uh, to schizophrenia uh, for Canadian society and societies around the world. George, if this works, do you know why it works? So that's what we're moving to, uh, to next, is looking at, at those critical brain areas that support this kind of motivation, specifically this willingness to work for a reward in the face of increasing demands. So the common analogy that I give people is that, you know, imagine you have a, a list of groceries that you want to pick up on your way home that you want to make uh, for a recipe for dinner. And you go to um, the first grocery store, they happen to be out of a particular item, uh, but you get everything else. You say, well, on my way home, there's another grocery store. Maybe I'll stop in there and pick up that last item. 
and there's, there's, a, there's a process that we go through as we start to plan these things out. We get to the second grocery store, they also happen to be out of that particular item. Some of us will say, you know what, I can't be bothered anymore. I'm just going to go home and make whatever I, I can from the ingredients that I have. But some people will go to that third grocery store and finally get that item. And so it's that process that we're trying to get at to understand what, where in the brain that, uh, that valuation comes from and then target that particular area for these folks with schizophrenia so that we can get them to, to be more motivated and to persist in some, some common tasks in their day-to-day -day lives. Do you think you're getting there? We think so. We think that this is, this is an opportunity to, uh, to move beyond what we've been doing so far. You know, the way we assess some of these symptoms uh, up until now is through uh, question and answers, uh, some self-report instruments as well, and some very simplistic computerized tasks. And ideally what we'd like to do is, is know what these folks are experiencing in the real world in the moment. And how's it going? It's going quite well. Uh, people seem to enjoy it quite a bit. They're, I think they're drawn <laughs> I by, why, yeah. they're drawn by the, the ability to use technology in a novel way. Um, it's, it's an engaging environment. They do complain that it's a bit boring. You know, there's, uh, it's very different from some standard video games. There are no people in the environment. There aren't cars or other traffic things, in part because we want to limit um, some of the other demands that, uh, that may cause difficulties for these folks and really get at the purest essence of measuring motivation in these folks. But they, they enjoy it. They, they like uh, seeing where technology is moving, uh, moving healthcare and mental health care and mental health research. Okay, so it, the video game is relatively simple right now. You're not asking people to go and hijack cars or any of that. No, other kind no, of not stuff. yet. Not very but different from other video yeah, games. I, yes. I, I got that. But <laughs> will you make it more complex as this process goes along? So that's the plan. Uh, we, uh, with uh, Dr. Wong and uh, a couple of other people, uh, Dr. Remington, who's also at CAMH, and Dr. Zaxanis at uh, the University of Toronto, we've um, uh, we've been looking at different modules for uh, for this kind of environment. Dr. Wong has a particular interest in navigating in a new environment. And so we've come together and have developed a six by six block virtual city. Hmm. And one of those areas is what we saw on the, uh, on the video, which is the, um, that motivation task that, that we get people to work on. And then there's also a, a navigation component as well that people can find their way in a new environment. And the hope is eventually to build in more uh, realistic sequences of tasks for example, um, you know, tapping into some of the processes that we would go through to look for a new job, to put a resume together, to, to go knock on someone's door and deliver a resume and go through that, that lifelike sequence of steps in a, in a controlled lab environment. If you have a kind of a unique chunk of the pie here, mm -hmm. why don't you patent it? It's a good question. So, you know, we we thought about about that at the beginning and had some discussions around it. You know, there's been a lot of a, a lot of other work that's that's used virtual reality technology in some other areas, and um, and so you know, one of the uh, one of the things that uh, that we had discussed with some folks was that. You know, it has to be somewhat, uh, somewhat different and, and unique, and, and it, is, it is to some extent. And then we had some concerns that, you know, patenting it, you know, may limit its uptake. What we want is to create a, a diverse environment and an open environment so that other people from around the world that may have parallel but not exactly the same interests as I do can use this as a, as a foundation and a building block so that eventually we can create a very rich environment that we can then translate into our clinics and do very rapid assessments for these folks. So you are more in the realm of sharing as opposed to competing with everybody else? Exactly. Why exactly. would you want to do that? Well, I think, I think that offers us uh, more hope for, uh, for progress in understanding some of these debilitating symptoms and, uh, and getting through that barrier of uh, improving people's functioning and getting them to, to recover. But you might not get your Nobel Prize going this route. Well, I may make people feel better. <laughs> okay, that seems like a good trade. George, thanks very much for visiting us here today. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it. That's great. Okay, our second innovation takes us into the world of genetics and how personalized medicine is about to revolutionize the treatment of mental illness. In uh, the Thornhill Medical Center, a group of family doctors have agreed to participate in our research study looking at how genetics can help the doctor write a prescription with more information about what might be the right drug and the right dose for this uh, particular patient. This has never been done before. Genetic testing for medications in primary care. The brain represents uh, a mysterious and unexplored territory. Some say you know, it's the most complicated object in the universe. With computer technology and our genetics and 
the good clinical care, we can figure out the blueprint of their brain and uh, start to make new discoveries that might lead to uh, new medications that don't have these uh, nasty side effects. By having this genetic test, we will be able to right off the bat know which medicines will work for them and which ones won't. Basically in a green, yellow, red, go, caution, stop type method. It's not really science fiction, it's leading edge science because it's happening right here, right now. And this taking of genetic material is just the beginning of a lot of stuff we're going to have happen in the future. And whereas right now you have a medical alert bracelet that says you're allergic to penicillin or that you're a diabetic, soon you'll be showing up in the emergency department with a little microchip that says, these are the medicines I can take for certain conditions, these are the medicines that I shouldn't take for certain conditions, and it will allow people to be able to get personalized medicine much better. It's not sci-fi, it's happening right now. And time now to meet the innovator behind that video piece, and he is Dr. James Kennedy, who is the Director of Neuroscience at CAMH. Welcome to the platform here. Thank you. Well, one of the things you said at the very beginning of that video was, this has never been done before. Could you take us through some of the firsts that you are involved with right now? Yes, uh, we at uh, CAMH Hospital uh, were the first to have a fully functioning uh, genetic test delivery system for the doctors, in this case the psychiatrists within the, you know, this is a research hospital, uh, and uh, you know, we're the biggest mental health center in Canada, and uh, so we were able to roll out this testing, but in this very, uh, you know, academic, uh, sophisticated environment. Uh, so we did the first there, and uh, after a couple of years of um, looking at how the genetic tests uh, came to the physician, what they understood, what they didn't understand. Uh, we were able to refine the process. And now we had another first where uh, for the first time we've delivered this testing to a uh, ordinary suburban uh, family care practice uh, where uh, you know these are the run of the mill patients. And uh, it's very important to get into family practice because 80% of all psychiatric medications are prescribed by primary care physicians. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to get out there and uh, we've done that uh, about six weeks ago and it's going quite well. Okay. What are the implications for this if it goes the way you hope it goes? Well, uh, the first thing is that uh, patients, um, let's say a person taking an antidepressant, for example, uh, typically it takes several weeks to find out whether the person is responding or not. And if, it, if they're, they, they are not responding, then it take, you have to start drug B, and it takes another several weeks. Uh, we we uh, fully expect we can shorten that process. We remove the trial and error, and based on the particular genetic makeup of the individual patient sitting in front of you, uh, we can be smarter about what, uh, exactly what drug we prescribe and at which dose and that'll get to the, pa the patient to a good response faster. They'll have less side effects because the medication is more tailored to them. Uh, and along the way, uh, it also saves healthcare costs, which is uh, good for the province of Ontario. I think they care about that kind of stuff these days. Yeah. They do. Uh, the, the frequency of drug A being prescribed and not working, how big a problem is that? Uh, well, in the case of antidepressants, uh, about 40 to 50 percent of the first try medications really don't work in a, in a satisfactory way. Hmm. And uh, we have done a study looking backwards in time uh, where people with, who didn't have a good match between their genetic makeup and the medication, it, it took four to five treatments for them to reach a satisfactory antidepressant response. Whereas if, if uh, they, the drug was, by chance, matched to their genetic makeup, it only took uh, two, two and a half treatments to achieve a, a good outcome. So shortening that process could have fantastic implications for patients. Indeed. Okay, you know our job in journalism is to find the misery and the dark side of everything. So mm -hmm. that's the premise for this next question, which is if you actually do manage to shorten that, that process, so that you're not going through four or five different prescriptions, doses, et cetera, before you finally hit pay dirt. Is there a danger that 
GPs will be less one-on-one -on -one engaged with their patients and will be quicker actually to just prescribe and show the door. Uh, no, uh, au contraire, I would say that... Uh, <laughs> I set you up for that one, didn't they, I? Yeah. Um, the patients, uh, you know, psychiatric care is not just medications, of course. And typically there are family aspects, uh, stress management aspects, and social aspects, uh, community, you know, we talk about neuron to neighborhood being the comprehensive psychiatric care. So getting the patient to a, a good mood more quickly will um, allow uh, more sophisticated treatments that embrace the patient's family. They can get into family therapy. Uh, the doctor will have more time to, to bring in uh, the relatives and more time to link up with, uh, say, social worker to arrange uh, re-employment. Uh, so it, it just gets the patient uh, doing more sophisticated things uh, that involve the whole healthcare team uh, much quicker. Dr. Jim Kennedy, everybody, thanks very much for coming up to the platform today. That's great, thanks. Okay, we're going to introduce our third video to you now. Most of us are familiar with electroconvulsive therapy and its use in treating mental illness, but the use of electricity on the brain does have its side effects, and our next innovator turned to another form of energy to stimulate the brain, and it's offering new hope to those with the most treatment resistant forms of depression. And we're now going to take a look at something called magnetic seizure therapy. Watch. I've been suffering with depression now for almost 20 years. So when Dr. Daskalakis provided me with the opportunity to try the MST, I was willing to try, you know, anything, whatever was out there. MST is a focally magnetically induced seizure. So it's focal in the sense that it's, it doesn't spread throughout the brain and cause widespread activation of the brain. This gets through the cortex and only targets those neurons that we are holding the coil over. So right now evaluating the early stages of MST to try to understand how to best deliver this treatment in an effort to optimize therapeutic response, get it as good as ECT, because if you can make a treatment as good as ECT, but avoid the memory side effects, the cognitive side effects of ECT, then you've, you've effectively developed a whole new treatment for patients with depression. It's giving me back hope and future, which I will be eternally grateful for. And I know with the Temerty Center, there's options, there's support, there's research that can help. Not only is it important to, to offer new hope, not only is it important to offer treatments with fewer side effects, but it's also very important to innovate so that we can continue to, to optimize our treatments and get our patients who suffer from these illnesses better. Our next innovator, Dr. Jeff Daskalakis, is director of the Temerty Center for Therapeutic Brain Intervention at CAMH and the innovator behind the use of MST in treating depression. Dr. D, welcome to the set. Nice to Thank have you. you here. You work in a field where lots of people have lots of preconceived notions about what you do. Uh, tell us why we are so nervous or uneasy about what you call electroconvulsive therapy, what probably the rest of the world calls electroshock. Um, electroconvulsive therapy was developed in the, in the late 30s, early 40s. Uh, and it was developed in part because people had known for some time that seizures were therapeutic in the brain, that people with severe psychiatric illness, when, if they had a spontaneous seizure, they would get a lot better. And so the effort was tried, um, there was an endeavor to try to mimic that effect, and it was done successfully. What soon people realized is that ECT was associated with tremendous cognitive effects. And there's no sugarcoating that. ECT is associated with tremendous cognitive effects, memory effects, but it's also extraordinarily effective. So it works 70% of the time when medications don't work. In other words, uh, if you are on a medication and, and haven't responded to one, two, three uh, treatment courses, ECT uh, is certainly a, a bona fide therapeutic option. Um, the resistance is because you also have to face the possibility that your memory may be significantly affected. And, and by virtue of the fact that your memory would be severely affected, you may not um, be inclined or even consider um, ECT as a treatment option. 
Did Jack Nicholson do more for bad PR for this than anybody else? He, he really did. I mean, it is, it is amazing. Uh, the movie continues to get aired because it was an Academy Award winner. It was amazing. It was it best was picture of the year. That's right. It was a powerful movie, and yet, and yet, the the image of, of ECT being promulgated as a as a, an intensive treatment that can destroy people's lives is is clearly um, exaggerated. For those who don't know, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. That's the movie that we're talking about. Came out, I guess, in the middle '70s, something That's like right. that. Uh, inducing a seizure in the brain does not sound like a good thing. Can you tell us why this makes sense in terms of a cure? Sure. Or so, treatment, rather? So, so as I mentioned, the, the seizure itself actually has many therapeutic benefits to it. Um, um, science is now starting to discover what those therapeutic benefits are. It affects wiring in the brain. It affects certain neurotransmitters that can actually help calm the brain. So the seizure itself is actually very therapeutically effective. Um, the problem with ECT is that the, is the way the seizure is induced Electrical current gets into the brain, gets into all the brain areas that we actually require uh, to form memories and disrupts those brain areas. And tell us about the particularly innovative approach that you are bringing to what has been a treatment that's been around for a long time. Um, magnetic seizure therapy is, is uh, applied directly to the frontal areas of the brain, the areas of the brain that are associated with depression, and it doesn't spread to other areas of the brain that are, that are uh, important in memory function. And so by being able to deliver the field in a very um, 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 orchestrated, a very focal way, um, you are actually targeting the brain areas that, that you need to target, and you're lessening the, the side effects um, because the brain areas that are associated with memory are relatively spared. Results so far? Results are amazing. I mean, you've seen one um, extraordinary patient who has been extraordinarily brave in, in, in coming forward, but, but it, the, the, the efforts have been amazing. We've had some real good success with this treatment. Uh, and, and perhaps most importantly, it is not only the innovation of the treatment, but, but it's, it's uh, patients embracing this treatment, not seeing it as, it, as, as ECT, and, and willing to go forward. So the actual procedure itself isn't the most frightening. The, the, what patients are, are afraid of and what they see in movies like uh, Cuckoo's Nest is the notion that their lives are going to be somehow disrupted, that they're not going to be able to remember fond experiences in their past, that they're not going to be the same person that they once were. And that is clearly not happening with MST. It's actually, it's actually rectifying a lot of the, the illness. And you said amazing success so far. How are you defining success? Well, success can be defined in two ways, but, but success is, in general, defined as no depressive symptoms, that we actually get rid of depressive symptoms entirely. And we've had an extraordinary number of patients who have had that, that robust response that we were hoping for. Depression goes away. That's right. Permanently? Not permanently. So um, these, are, are, these treatments um, are very fast acting. They work quickly, um, sometimes as early as three or four treatments and sometimes as many as 15 to 20 treatments. Um, nevertheless, that is still a relatively short period of time when you consider other treatment strategies for illnesses like depression. Now, you know, in general, when I went to medical school, I learned that as fast as a treatment, the faster a treatment works, the faster its effects go away whenever you stop the treatment. And this is certainly true for, for, illness, for, uh, for treatments like MST and ECT. If you abruptly stop the treatment, it doesn't, uh, it, the illness comes back, and it comes back very quickly. So you need to maintain people's wellness. But you can maintain people's wellness uh, with treatments over the matter of over a matter of four to six months and, and eventually help them come off the treatment and we've been successful so far at that. Gotcha. Dr. Jeff Daskalakis, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, time now for the fourth of five videos that we're going to show. Employment, of course, is an important part of the recovery process for people who are dealing with mental illness. CAMH psychologist Sean Kidd is trying to find out what makes some social entrepreneurs successful at providing jobs and a sense of well-being for people living with mental illness. Let's have a look. I run a interior and exterior landscaping business. We began in 2001 as a way to combat the high unemployment rate with folks with mental health issues. Our mandate actually is to employ, improve their lives both socially and economically. Social enterprises are incredibly important for people's health and recovery. A lot of people have been told they shouldn't work, they, they can't work, and we feel that people will live up to the expectations that you have of them. 
everyone that works for us works because they want to work and they want to learn and they want to grow. You speak to the people that have, that have and are working for the Parkdale Green Thumb, they really speak about um, how it's, it is a community in and of itself and it really provides pathways for people um, to wellness and pathways uh, in their recovery process. So their self-concept and identity expands from being a label, from being a mental illness to a person who's an employee, who has a valued uh, identity related to work. And also work is of course a gateway to many other social spheres that, that it helps I think people really fully engage in the recovery and have the kind of opportunities that can lead to people kind of getting on with their lives outside of a mental illness. And here's our dynamic duo up here on the platform at Mars right now. Please welcome the CAMH scientist, Sean Kidd, and the business manager of Parkdale Green Thumb, Maggie Griffin. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Sean, I want to start with you because you used a phrase in that video that some people may not have heard before, social enterprise entrepreneurship. Okay. What is that? So a social enterprise is, is a business where the primary profit, as it were, is, is a social profit. So it offers As opposed to money. Yeah, exactly. It might make money, but it's all spun back into sort of the social enterprise, which is to benefit, you know, typically marginalized communities. And social entrepreneurs are people that, that set up and start uh, social um, enterprises. So. so what's your study trying to accomplish at the end of the day? So it, I see it very much as an initial step. And what we wanted to find out is, is, is there a coherent model for these types of social enterprises or these, what these social entrepreneurs are doing. And what we did find is there are a lot of similarities, a lot of kind of a pathway to success that, that many folks like Maggie um, have found. And our next step then is to see are there ways of propagating it? Because often the problem is, is, is these are, are very effective models for helping people get on with their lives, but they're not often well known and people often have to reinvent a lot of wheels. So our next step is to start to take a look at um, are there ways that we can, we can facilitate that more effectively and articulate the outcomes of, of places like the Green Thumb a bit better. So. And as a result, you met her. Yep. Now you tell us more about what you, what do you do at the Green Thumb? Um, I manage the business. Uh, there are 14 part-time employees and I have also I have a lead hand and um, we try to work year-round but a lot of our work is uh, seasonal. Um, is it hard to do your do work when, when spring is obviously it's taking its time hard, getting here? Especially when we had spring very early the last few years this hmm. is just like sitting at the edge of the cliff waiting <laughs> waiting and it's hard on the staff too because they want to get back and get outside. Um, so we we find different clients, um, which is difficult to, to do and run the, the business uh, as well. And um, then we do training, on the job training. Um, a lot of times it's kind of a constant thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tell us more uh, about the kind of people who work for you. Who are they? Um, they are people who really want to work. They really want to be able to, to do something and achieve something in their lives. And um, through growing things, as I said, uh, it's the best way um, for a lot of people to do it. Are um, they all people, they Maggie, come, who are suffering from mental illness? They are all people who are suffering from mental illness, Our, um, myself included. Um, so I understand um, and can deal with some of the issues that come up for them. A lot of them have, have been in isolation or told that they, they can't work. So this really gives them a sense of, of somewhere to go and they work because they want to, and it gives them a community um, to be involved in. Maggie, there's got to be an easier way to make a living. Why do you do this? <laughs> I love my job. I think uh, I trained my whole life to do my job, and uh, I've been there nine years now running this business. It's very rewarding um, to see people. I mean, you saw some of them in the, in the video. To see people um, laugh and have fun. I, I often say there's no laughing at work. You cannot laugh at work. It's a very serious business, but I mean, it's really great. They make lifelong friends um, working with us. And we're not um, a program per se that we expect people to move on. We're a, a real business, real work for real pay. Why does this work? Why does it work? Well, that, that, I think that was part of our part of our question, and I and I think that it's it's a number of factors that go into it. Um, one piece of it is, as I'm sure uh, you've maybe picked up from some of the other people interviewed here, is in general um, mental illness is is caused uh, and maintained by a complex constellation of factors: some social uh, marginalization. 
uh, poverty, unemployment, these kinds of pieces as well as some biological factors as well. Um, and what businesses uh, like Maggie's successfully do is find a point of leverage in a complex system that really tip things for people. And, and so it's finding, finding a, an answer that really carries a lot of weight in the, in the spectrum of problems that come along with it. In a place like the Green Thumb, um, it gives people a community, it, it provides some income, it provides an identity that, that's outside of, of just being a person with a mental illness, um, and really kind of provides a pathway to, to getting on with life. And I think Maggie and, and folks like her have found uh, really effective ways of doing that, as well as running sharp businesses. Like these, these aren't uh, these aren't sort of just just you know, nice ideas that come together. There, there's there's a hard business sense that comes into running a successful social enterprise. And so. well, let me follow up with Maggie on that because you've experienced this story from both sides. I guess you mm -hmm. are running a business, and you have lived experience, as they say, with mental right. health issues. Yeah. So, what would you tell prospective employers out there about the advisability of hiring people who are challenged by mental health issues? Um, I, I believe, I mean, the folks that work with me, um, they work 150%. They, I just think they, it's not that they have to prove something. A lot of people will do it for the social component, but that's not something that I push when I go to meet prospective clients. We're a business first, and we're also a social component. So um, just in our business revenue last year, um, we put um, $45,000 in directly into our employees' pockets, which I'm really, really proud of. I mean, it took a lot of work on everyone's part to, to have a good uh, business return. Um, but we, they all work, we work together. We work as a team, and I think that's what works. It does, it's not from the top down. The door is always open. People can come in anytime and really talk about anything. I'm not a social worker, but we can guide them to other supports. Um, and I work for a really great organization that supports me. Yeah. Okay, Sean Kidd, Maggie Griffin, great of you to join us on the stage here at Mars Thank Island. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, great. Okay, we're going to do one more video, and here it comes. What if you have a history of addictions or mental illness, and you want to start your own business? Could you get a startup loan? Well, a partnership between CAMH and the Rotman School of Management, backed by Mars Innovation, takes the concept of micro-lending and builds on it. Watch this video. My company is called Tickety Boutique, and it's a vintage secondhand curio emporium. I can definitely say that I've been wanting to do something like this for the entirety of my life. It's the culmination of years of dreaming and hoping and wishing and if it hadn't been for, for Rise then I wouldn't have been able to engage in the business. To finally be here it, it feels absolutely fantastic. I love it every time somebody comes into the store whether they buy something or not. It's really been a fantastic experience for me so far. Sandra Rotman is the founder of RISE and it was in 2009 when she brought together the Rotman School of Management and the Center for Addiction and Mental Health to address the employment barrier that exists among people with a history of mental health or addiction challenges. Together, the Rotman School and CAMH focused on entrepreneurship and created RISE Asset Development, which is an organization that provides microfinancing and mentorship to assist individuals with a history of mental health or addiction challenges grow and develop small businesses. A great example of a successful client that we've worked with is Allison Moyer. And she received a $6,000 loan from Rise at the end of last year. For me, it's, it's this combination of microfinance and mental health, which is innovative, which is different, and that it can have quite a bit of impact on an individual. And here is our fifth guest up on the platform. This is Narinder Dami, who is the Executive Director of the innovative RISE Asset Development Program. And we welcome you to the platform. Thank you. <laughs> applause, applause. Okay. Where did this idea come from? So the idea was sparked uh, by Sandra Rotman through her experience as an outpatient at KMH. So Sandra Rotman is a community leader, has invested 
quite a bit into the Canadian innovation of, of healthcare. Married and to a guy named Joe Rotman? Yes. I've heard of him too, yeah, okay. Um, and she's also our seed funder and vice chair of our board. So through her experience at, at CAMH, she identified that there was this untapped potential and entrepreneur spirit among the individuals she was with, but a lack of employment opportunities. And she felt that if we were able to give her the right skills, or to give them, to give individuals, the right skills and resources to support business growth, we could help start small, successful small businesses. We don't tend to think of people who are experiencing mental health issues with being entrepreneurial. That's there? It is. It's, and, and you see a lot of individuals who already day to day have informal types of businesses. So part of what we do at, at times with uh, certain clients is help formalize those and help grow those and build those. Okay. We know about micro lending because yeah. that's gone on for a long time all around the world. But you've got a little innovation on it here. What are you doing differently? The difference here and the unique piece is that we're working with a very targeted population group, so people who've had a history of mental health or addiction challenges. And microfinance is, is very similar when you look internationally, internationally and domestically. It's about the provision of small amounts of capital to individuals who otherwise would not be able to access it. Uh, but we here, are we've created a very flexible and adaptive program that provides microfinancing and mentorship. So we link into our business school alumni and connect each of our entrepreneurs with somebody who could support them through the growth of their business. Okay, so take us through it. Somebody approaches you, they yep. got an idea for a business, yep. they want a loan, what do they do? Um, so it depends what stage they're at. So if they have a business plan, assembled, then we'll work with them to identify what type of financing they need, what amount they need, and how we can structure that. And then they'll eventually, once their package is ready, get to our investment committee who will make the final decision of, of financing. If the individual is still in the business idea stage, we can help them through various training programs. So we have a youth small business program, and we're launching a group lending small business program um, this month. And then, once they're ready with a business plan, we can support them in the next stages of the business application. And the money you lend out is as little as, or as much as what? We've lent as little as $200, and we've our, our, our largest loan to date is 9000 But um, we can go up to 25000 as a micro lender in Canada. And how is your track record? Good. Um, so yeah. we've been working with over, we've worked with over 300 clients. Um, we've, we've financed 34 of those clients, over 120,000 dispersed, and we're approximately at a 5% default rate. And how does that compare to any, any other institution that lends money in society? I think pretty well. Pretty good. So, it sounds yes, like it. Yeah, yes. I would think so too. Yeah. Now, if, they were go if, if, if your clients were to go to a regular financial institution to do this, they would go through a particular screening process, yes. as you would, yeah. right? How, is your process different from a regular bank's? It is different. So when, when we're thinking about microfinance, we're not only looking at the business viability, but we're also looking at the character of the individual. Another really important piece is that we're not, we're not basing our decision on a credit score. So many of our clients are, in, are on income support, so government um, disability programs, or they have poor credit, or they have high debt. Um, in those situations, they make them, they're, un, they're not able to access the traditional forms of financing that exist. Narinder, it's good of you to join us up here on the stage. Thanks a lot Thank for your you. help tonight. Yeah. <laughs> there was a woman in the last video that we saw who happens to be here tonight. I thought it might be fun just to chat with her for a minute or so. Allison, will you stand up? You are the one who started that business, courtesy of the program we just saw. Correct. And I just wanted to ask you, how you doing? I'm doing really well. The business is going very well. We've opened in February. We've been progressing as forecasted. So yeah, everything's going very, very well. You're meeting your targets? Yes, I am. You're going to pay your money back? I'm going to pay my money back. <laughs> That's what they want to know. Yeah. Good for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have in the hall, sorry my back's to you, but a microphone here and a microphone here. And whoever wants to ask a question, now is the time. We've got some of the best experts in the country up here. I know this is a Canadian audience and nobody wants to go first. But I'm going to look for a very brave person. I just found him. Go to that microphone there, sir, if you would. And I thank you for starting things off. And uh, by all means, if you want to, say who you are, who you represent, and who the question is for, and off to the races we are. Great. 
Uh, hello, thanks a lot for your, uh, your expertise and your, really a lot of your studies, which I thought was really very true. Uh, so I'm, my name is Natish Peters, and I'm a student at Rothman at the University of Toronto. And uh, so my question really emphasizes the idea of, so I felt like a lot of the breakthrough studies were, were amazing, right? But to what extent would this allow for collaboration to really empower people that have, that are subject to mental health issues, right? I mean, to what extent are we empowering them to make their own decisions? Well, I think that, that you saw part of that today, involving people with the experience of, of mental illness to be part of uh, our environment, to be part of the, uh, uh, the presentations that you saw on video and in, in person. And uh, I would say that if there is any area of healthcare where we're trying to, in, to hear the voices of uh, individuals who have the experience of mental illness, it's, or, or in healthcare, it's the, it's the world of mental health where we have the biggest opportunity. Are we doing it uh, perfectly? Absolutely not. Uh, do we have uh, opportunities to formalize it? We absolutely do, and are we, uh, we going to try? Yes. Sean, this one seems to be in your wheelhouse as well. To what extent does all of this empower the individual to improve? Well, I, I, think, I think it's best seen as, as, as an act of collaboration, and I think a few folks have addressed that, that, that uh, mental illness is obviously an illness that, that has components that are biological for many people um, requiring medication, but also there's a social component. Um, so I think that's something we're, we're looking to do and getting better at is finding ways um, that you can truly uh, take care from the hospital to the community and, and in various ways empower people to, to really take charge of their, their own process of recovery, whether it's, whether it's uh, getting the proper medication, um, getting on with work and, and getting on with their lives. So. Hi. Um, so I'm a bit skeptical about the virtual reality program in terms of targeting towards people with schizophrenia because uh, someone close to me has had schizophrenia for eight years and I know that they already have a hard time distinguishing reality and I feel like adding another layer is even more confusing and also symptoms of the TV and the radio talking to them, so then adding almost another electronic component. So I'm just wondering how exactly it works towards people with schizophrenia. It just doesn't connect in my mind. George? Thanks, that, that's a great question. Um, so I'll tell you that the, uh, the folks that we've had go, go through this, um, and so it's, o it's over 50 uh, individuals with schizophrenia right now, um, and then another 50 healthy individuals. Uh, nobody has, has come out of it and said, you know, I feel worse, my symptoms are worse, nothing like that. They actually enjoy uh, engaging technology. You know, it's, it's important to, to recognize that, you know, these are, these are folks that, you know, um, more or less have had, have had their so-called positive symptoms of, of schizophrenia, the, the hallucinations and de delusions that we often think of in this illness have been relatively well treated. They're now living out of hospital in the community um, and they're struggling with some other uh, important uh, domains of symptoms and these are motivation and things like memory, attention, processing speed. And it's those areas that seem to drive their inability to get back to the f level of functioning that they were having before they had the symptoms. And so our goal is to target, uh, to target those symptoms as early as possible and then use this as a tool to get them back to the things that they want to be doing. So, so it's, it's not in place of the, the, the medications and other, other treatments, it's an augmentation of it. Terrific. This microphone here. Oh, Steve Lurie. Hi, go Hi. ahead. Steve Lurie from the CMHA Toronto branch. Uh, I've been inspired by both the scientific and social innovations we've heard about today, but I think it's part of a larger problem. What, what do we need to do to ensure that we do a better job serving uh, the more than one in three people uh, who actually get care when six in ten don't? And, uh, you know, the mental health share of spending has actually declined from its pl uh, in terms of health spending in terms of what it was in 1979 and research funding lags. So despite all this wonderful work that Cam H and others are doing, I guess this is a question for our innovation hosts, Catherine and Ilsa, what do we need to do to sort of make the case for investing more in mental health? Catherine? I think I'd start in the same way I started uh, at the beginning of this event, to say that we are working hard to increase awareness surrounding uh, uh, the problem of mental illness and addiction in our population and the access to care issues. And uh, events like this are the perfect venue to make that reach broader and, and, and deeper, and we have, to, we have to build on that. 
from an organizational point of view, everything that we do, everything uh, in our strategy is driving towards enhancing the, our ability to uh, help people with access and transition in the, uh, in, on, on the journey of, of, of any particular mental illness. But uh, I'll hand over to Ilsa to talk about how we, can, uh, uh, how we can do better, how we can spread the word, how we can uh, demand that the investment be more in keeping with the burden of illness in, in, our, in our society. I think part of the challenge also is, um, you know, we've, we've heard some fantastic uh, breakthrough innovations, but we also have to focus on the, the active diffusion and adoption of innovation. And I think, uh, you know, as a community, and uh, Chem H works hard on this, bringing together um, the actors in the system, including policymakers, including funders, uh, to understand that the adoption process is as important as the upfront innovation process because uh, it doesn't matter how great our innovations are if they don't uh, reach patients at the front line. Um, and and that's, that's often a, a, a challenging uh, uh, process to, uh, to make that system tip and, and change practice and change awareness both on the patient and on the, on the system side. Over here, please. Thank you. I'm so excited to hear about all this research. It's really um, just very exciting. Um, my name is Iris, and as a family member, my question today focuses on early intervention. Um, with regards to um, new research that's come out, well, not that recent research regarding uh, marijuana, actually tripling or even quadrupling the risk of schizophrenia, uh, depending on whether there's an early age of onset and so on. Um, now when I look back on my last uh, 12 years of chaos, I wonder as a parent, I should have been uh, less strict about alcohol and very strict about marijuana. Hmm. Is there any way, is there any research on that um, subject matter and uh, how can we get the message out if that's uh, something that should be shared really as a public health issue, issue? First of all, does everybody agree with the premise of the question? Yes? Jim, you're saying yes. Okay. You want to speak to it? Yes, actually, we're uh, just publishing a paper on this topic. Um, a key thing to understand is that the adolescent brain is not uh, fully developed, and it's more sensitive to the effects of marijuana, you know, from ages 12 to, say, 18. And we've just uh, done a research study uh, with a gene that, uh, in some variants of that gene, uh, teenagers are more sensitive to the effects of marijuana, and uh, it, it what we found is that the uh, people who are smoking marijuana you know, almost daily when they're teenagers, that um, causes them to get uh, schizophrenia about a year and a half before their peers who may be smoking only once a month or not at all. And so that was a big difference. And you think of a year and a half in a teenager's life, that's a huge amount of time. Yeah. It's a huge amount of schooling. And to lose that you know, creates more disasters. Maggie, I'm tempted to ask about those plants you're growing, but maybe uh, <laughs> maybe we'll leave that Not for another, your show. another opportunity. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Last question here. Thank you. I have a very practical question for Dr. Kennedy. My name is Joanne. I'm uh, a typical senior citizen of the city of Toronto. Uh, sir, uh, how do I get one of those microchips? How long does it take? <laughs> um, how much does it cost? And what equipment will my doctor or the hospital need to be able to read it? And I must admit, compared to most people in this room, time is running out for me. I have more history than future, but I'd like to have in my future one of those chips. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're right. It, it's, uh, it becomes all the more important as we get older because our bodies become less resilient uh, to handle doses of medication that are off the mark or a, a wrong medication for your particular genotype. Uh, so we're going to be rolling this out into um, uh, elder care homes and nursing homes uh, in the next six months. I'd like you to speed it up. Thank you. That's <laughs> good. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. We want to thank Mars. We want to thank Cam H. Uh, we want to thank the innovators for taking time out of their schedules to be with us here tonight. We want to thank this audience for coming out tonight. And, of course, those of you who are participating online, we're grateful for your participation as well. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for being with us this evening. And good night from the Mars Discovery District in downtown Toronto.
Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.